You're listening to Level Up with Melissa Zalouf from Iron Source. All right. So welcome back, everyone. I'm Melissa Zalouf, and you're listening to Level Up, the podcast for people who love making, growing, and of course, playing mobile games. Today on the show, as part of our uh, mini series on blockchain based games, we have our co hosts, Anton and Kenrick from Play Ventures, and guest, John Jordan, uh, who's a consultant at Playmint. Thank you, everyone, for being on the show today. Thanks, Sid Size. It's great to be back. Thanks for having us. From, from a couple of hours ago. Uh, he really means it, guys. Um, <laughs> so in today's episode, we're going to be talking about how online communities will shape the future of blockchain games. But before we dive in, as we always do, uh, John, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into the game industry, um, sure. and how slash why you're passionate about blockchain gaming? Absolutely. Yeah, so I've been in games for um, over 20 years now. Uh, majority of that time I've been a journalist, um, so started writing um, Edge magazine, if people remember that. Uh, co-founded a company called Steel Media, which is best known for Pocket Gamer, the websites and the conferences. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in free-to-play mobile um, during that time. And then at the start of uh, 2018, so, so literally four years ago, um, I started uh, looking at blockchain games. So I went to a conference and heard some interesting stuff there. And that was actually sort of just about the time when um, Ethereum was taking off as a blockchain. Um, so lots of people sort of were getting into games then. So I've really been in that ever since. And as you say, yes, I, I consult actually for, for a few different companies, so about half a dozen game developers. Um, and I also do some consulting for some investors as well. So um, um, I also run my own YouTube channel, Modest a Modest Affair, but um, things like that, podcasts and stuff. So I'm just uh, very focused on, on blockchain. Uh, why do I think that's interesting? Well, at a very top level, I just think it's uh, an interesting, um, the technology is interesting in, in and of itself, but I think for games, it does allow um, people who are playing games to have ownership in the games themselves, which is something we've not really seen, um, at least legally <laughs> or even technically before. Um, and that has quite a lot of implications, I think, for developers in terms of sort of letting go of control um, or letting go of sort of the, the control they have over over the product um, and, you know, giving that some of that to the community. And, you know, it's, it's a very uh, early field. We're, we're kind of seeing very sort of early stage experiments in that. But I think uh, generally, in most cases, I think it will be good um, for the sort of game uh, game community where you just um, sort of everyone, we sort of lose a little bit the distinction between developers and, and players and that all sort of becomes a little bit of a sort of mixed up uh, situation, which, you know, it's happening, it's been happening over the last, you know, since, since the internet came around. So it's, it's not a new trend, trend from that point of view, but the ability to own sort of financial, have financial value, have financial stake in these projects, I think is quite a big uh, change. Awesome. Uh, well, th- th- thanks for the rundown, John. I think I think I remember reading your stuff on Blockchain Gamer also for quite some time in event a few years ago. Now, when I was still looking for yeah. looking for validation for some of my own own thoughts also on, on Blockchain Gamer, and it felt felt good to see that w- w- one is not in an echo chamber. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll there weren't there weren't many of us though, were there? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but but maybe to start off, what I think is um, an interesting interesting topic to dig in that specific, specifically in the beginning is really thinking about kind of what the catalysts have been during the past year for kind of mm. the, the rise of, of, of games also in this in this subsector if you will or, or, or games using this tech uh, and obviously you've been involved in this uh, for for a few years already uh, uh, but um, if we look at what started happening at the beginning of last year mainly with top shot and obviously increasingly axi what what do you think are some of the main things or catalysts that for, for blockchain gaming to to allow for the moment hmm. that it started having sometime early early last year? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a few different things. I mean, partly it is a sort of you know uh, technology sort of coming along, and you know, I think everyone would sort of agree a lot of blockchain stuff is is still sort of fairly sort of held together with with sort of duct tape and, and bits of. Uh, sort of elastic bands and things, <laughs> um, um, but um, I think I think by I think you know for sort of 2018, 2019, and twenty twenty, that was a time when sort of a lot of experimentation happened. Um, there wasn't a lot of actually wasn't really a lot of money floating around. There wasn't a lot of investment. So if you were in that space, you sort of had to, had to be quite committed to it. You, you know, you weren't. Um, there's always some sort of idea of speculation, but but the, you, you know, there weren't people making tons of money. Basically, during those years, there were 
blockchain game developers going out of business because they couldn't pay rent. I mean, that was sort of what happened. And even, you know, with Axie sort of famously at the end of 2019, it's pretty much, you know, they almost went bust. Um, or at least almost ran yeah, out of money. I think, for their uh, I think that's going to be an interesting lesson in, in treasury management for many of the studios that are now raising capital mm. through, through NFT sales and putting out their governance token in, in an ICO or, or, or something similar to yeah. sort of not, not maybe be too overly optimistic and keeping the whole treasury in, in some of those proceeds, but, but balancing that out a bit to make sure that sort of the studios can actually manage and survive mm. those, those ups mm. and downs that most likely are inevitable at some point. Well, we definitely, definitely at the moment. <laughs> uh, who knows? Who knows by the time the podcast comes out? But we've basically seen like you know thirty to fifty percent de- decrease in, in in a lot of tokens over the last week. So, um, <laughs> uh, but but I, but I think those, those times are you know they they do have a sort of a hardening effect um, and a sort of a forcing sort of commitment on people. And definitely, I guess we'll talk about Axie because that's you know the the still the most high profile project. Um, but during those times, yeah, that was sort of, I think when they built their community, when they sort of had people who were interested in that product, not because they could make a lot of money, but they were just, you know, it was something new. It was sort of fascinating. Um, I guess maybe the developers were more sort of active in, in the sort of discord and, and those sort of community channels because they were, you know, <laughs> they, they weren't sort of a massive global success at that stage. So, so I think you sort of built up some of those people who were really committed to the project, really happy to just buy a lot of NFTs, whether that was sort of axes or land, and just hold on to them. Um, and obviously that has a financial impact on, you know, in terms of supply and demand. Um, so, so I think I, I think there's that sort of period, um, you know, really helped for those uh, projects. But it's, even saying that, I think, as, as you pointed out, sort, sort of NBA Top Shot was the really big sort of thing that took off at the start of 2021. I think that was pretty much a surprise to everyone, including Dapper Labs, that 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 project just got so big so quickly um and you know it, it sort of followed uh yeah so a few other things going on going on with sort of to- crypto token prices as well um but 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 that just really exploded and i guess it was the first time we saw a sort of mass market brand as in this sort of nba uh sort of combining with some sort of ability to to buy nfts and sell nfts on a, on a marketplace so i think i think that just got a lot, that's the scale of that project particularly North America, got a lot of people interested um, that this was a bit more serious than people making, you know, crypto kitties. So, okay, so t- tying into that, uh, John, um, where, where do you think we're now in, in terms of the adoption curve? So it, it feels like we're still quite early, right? Like what phase do you think we're at? Um, do you think we'll reach mainstream or what is even defined as mainstream adoption here? And, and what are some of the main obstacles you think we have to overcome in order to get kind of from the early adopters to the more mainstream. Yeah, so, <laughs> so it's one of, the, one of those questions that's very sort of loaded with exactly what you mean by, by the definition, really. Um, yeah. I mean, it's difficult. Uh, I'm always a bit nervous about, you know, every, everyone, and certainly in, in sort of crypto land, everyone's always saying, oh, if you're reading this, you're, you're early, or we're really early, and you know. And, you know, to some degree, yes, you know, that on a sort of personal level, I think, Certainly, when I got in in 2018, I was like, "Oh, I'm miles too late. All the interesting stuff happened, you know." Um, and then, and then, sort of, uh, nothing happened for about two years. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I think from an individual sort of point of view, if you're interested in this, you know, it's never, it's never, you're never too late, sort of thing. There's always loads of interesting stuff sort of happening. Uh, you know, I'm not really sure. I guess uh, coming to the mass market question, quite, I don't really know in my head what I think what I think mass market adoption is. So, at the moment, you know, we've started to see. You know, so, you know, projects with with say like a you know a million um, sort of players to some degree. So I guess Axie Infinity was was uh, two point five million DAUs um, um, sort of at its peak a few months ago. Um, so so, so to, you know th- that is in some degree mass adoption. Now the fact it was adoption by sort of a certain sort of group of uh, players, particularly from developing countries, you know, Indonesia, Philippines, Brazil, places like that, you know. Does that mean it's not mass market? Well, probably not for what we think of as mass market, sort of North American, Western Europe adoption. Um, so, so I do kind of think the thing about sort of things that are built on crypto is you have a sort of they're very global, you know. So the, the sort of the point of decentralized systems is is everyone can access them. Um, so, so what does, you know, does mass market mean? The three billion gamers we've got playing, you know, mainly mobile games. Um, you know, does mass market, when we talk about mass market, I think 
when you talk about it there, you were maybe I'm think, putting words in your head, but was maybe more about North American sort of Western European sort of mass market gamers. And obviously, from that audience, you'd probably say we've seen a you know we have seen a pretty strong backlash against against that. So you know, I, I think we see it, it sort of it depends on your position on on what you see as sort of mainstream, I suppose. Um, uh, I, I suppose the the question is like. Um, and, and it ties into the obstacles then, right? Like, mm. do you see them appearing on the, in, in the top 10 on an app store at any point in the, in the near future? Well, like, no, because I don't think, I, th- <laughs> I don't think app stores allow them. So, so um, you know, they, they clearly are, you know, I think when a, when a disruption like this comes in, then clearly, it, it you know, for it to be a disruption, that means that there's people at the, the sort of who are doing very well out of the sort of the current situation, you know, generally don't like it because it, it's they've spent their time building up a sort of a business or an ecosystem in a certain way. And now something's coming along that's basically going to sort of, if not dethrone them, take away some of their power. So, you know, to some degree, going back to the mass market thing, I think, you know, in the gaming space, we, we have some very big channels for games distribution. And that's Steam, which has said it doesn't want NFT games in there. And that's the App Store and the Google Play Store. Um, neither of which has sort of formally said um, that they don't want that sort of stuff. And there are, you know, there are blockchain enabled uh, games on those channels. And clearly there are, there's a load of crypto stuff as well. Um, but they're not they're not sort of openly sort of adopting it yet. And there's, and even like the, the Epic Store, who've sort of said they'll look, they'll look at it. I mean, no, there's no real in that distribution sort of channel, which is which is pretty key. You know, there's no real champion saying, yeah, we're going to really sort of go for this. Um, so, and obviously, at that, that stage, you've sort of got quite a big infrastructure piece for somewhat for a newcomer to sort of come in and build. And there are people trying to build sort of blockchain app stores. There are people trying to build sort of blockchain versions of Steam. You know, I, I think that comes a little bit further down the road. Uh, but equally, you, Axie Infinity is basically a, is a mobile app built on an APK. So, it's people just downloading it and side loading it into their phones, which is we don't do in Western Europe and North America, but that's what everyone does in Southeast Asia. Um, so, so you know, to, to that degree that you know there are there are you know that is an obstacle for mass market kind of usage, I think in in, in the West. But I probably would see certainly when we, I don't think we we'll talk about free to play, uh, sorry, free to play, free to earn sort of games as a phenomenon. Um, you know, equally those games are not really you know those games really don't appeal to sort of um, people in Western Europe and North America because we most of us thankfully you know it doesn't really move the dial very much for, for us to spend six hours or eight hours a day earning another. Twenty dollars a day, you know, those things just don't work for us. So, so I think you know, at one level, a lot of the sort of crypto, more crypto-focused stuff is focused on, you know, emerging markets, and and that plays very differently into the sort of the type of games that are out there um, compared to what we would consider um, a game. And I think that's sort of where the backlash stuff comes from uh, to some degree as well, um, from the sort of the, the hardcore PC gamers or console players. Mm. And that's actually, I think, a great segue into kind of the, the topic we have at hand here, which is kind of the role of the community uh, mm. in, in these games when we talk about user acquisition and distribution. Now, if we look at mobile free-to-play up until now, uh, obviously, there's been a big emphasis on performance marketing. And, and for this, the current breed of free-to-play developers out there, it's been kind of the modus operandi of growing growing your game. Uh, and there hasn't been, at least on mobile free-to-play, it's quite light touch to to kind of be involved in having people on Discord, building through yeah. through sort of organic mm-hmm. traction, etc. But now, if we look at these early early games in this space, uh, the predominant they're kind of turning this acquisition model upside down, and the predominant model for growing these these communities has been kind of tapping into the grassroots uh, and and sort of aligning the early incentives with the community to to make sure they also they are also vested in bringing bringing more players and making making the game more more mm-hmm. fun and uh and 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 so forth so what do you think sort of just to break some of these sort of definitions break down these definitions what do you how do you see uh what when we talk about community what what does it mean in context of blockchain gaming and um Mm. where are these communities located uh and and how do they operate generally yeah 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 i think (laughs) i mean i think we all like to have things broken down into nice 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 little numbers so so often when people go blockchain projects where we've got a great community it basically means they have a lot of people on discord or or, or maybe telegram i mean discord is, is the sort of place where the, the games people tend to go um 
you know, and it is true there are some um, in terms of just kind of the, the raw numbers. There are some enormous uh, sort of discords. Um, I can't remember what actually is at the moment, but uh, they kept hitting the sort of discord limit. I can't remember it's eight hundred thousand or something like that. Um, so they are literally one of the biggest sort of discords out there, um, and it's sort of similar with many of the sort of the NFT projects. Um, and you know, blockchain games. You know, I think you know it's, unless you're doing something very clever, you know blockchain games are the first thing people do when they see a new blockchain game is they go to the discord and sort of, you know try and see what's going on in there and you know how many active people are in there um sort of what 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 are they people asking about um but i think you know that because everything you know everything in blockchain and crypto is is ha- sort of has to have a sort of speculative element to it i mean that's i think a lot of people looking from the outside looking in see that as as, as sort of like you know the one of the reasons for the backlash they see that you know it's all about sort of gambling or it's all about sort of this kind of uh, you know um ponzi scheme type stuff um and while i would disagree with that we have to sort you know part of part of the reason people are interested in it is because you know you can either sort of make um you know money which you can't do in other ways by playing games or some of these assets clearly have gone from you know literally zero to you know hundreds of thousands of dollars so there is a speculative to speculative element to that and that obviously feeds into to the discords because people are interested in you know this is sort of a uh, sort of meme type stuff when people when people go you know you know any project you know when's the token going to come out when's the when's the you know the in-game currency going to come out you know how can i get access to the whitelist so the whitelist is it would be typically um you know a, a restriction so only people who are sort of really supposedly committed to the project and maybe mint an nft or or, or get to buy the um the, the token um but clearly a lot, a lot of that community is actually just driven by can i basically get something you know can i make money off this um, yeah that, that, that was actually uh, my, my follow-up question here like community is always a you know it's, it's a buzzword almost right mm. if you be like in crypto with all the projects it's all about the community mm. um, maybe maybe if you if can you perhaps compare a kind of traditional games community versus uh, kind of a, uh, a blockchain based game community? And, and from there, can we distill how much the tokenomics or the token actually plays a part in these communities versus people who are actually in it for, uh, for the game? Uh, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say I've had enormous sort of uh, experience with sort of non blockchain game communities really. Um, and, and and I, I just think in most cases they are the blockchain bit. You know, even for people who are not necessarily interested in making a quick buck, you know, I, th- I think it would be dishonest for, for us to say that that doesn't play into you know into any of our sort of incentive. Because the whole point of having a blockchain connected to a sort of a, any project, but certainly a game project, is is that it it is a it is a process by which the success, financial success of that project, can be shared amongst the community members. So I do think there is an inherent you know, there's an it's a diff, very difficult balance between how do you deal with, you know, pure 100 percent speculators who are going to come into your project, basically try and get what money that they can, and then move off move off to the next project. So they're clearly not so much in games, but clearly in, in, in crypto there is that sort of that sort of um, you know uh, sort of dynamic where individuals or groups of people come in and sort of do that. Um, I, I would actually kind of say, you know, it's never it's never pleasant when when crypto prices sort of sort of crash like they have done, but but as we've seen in previous years, you know, that is actually quite a good, those sort of shocks are quite good to filter out community because if there's no promise of, of like a quick buck or, you know, you've just spent $500 buying some tokens that are now worth $200, um, then that's quite a good, that's quite a good incentive for people who aren't interested to sort of get out, you know, because they just look for the next thing. So, so I do think that community in, in that sense is sort of a dynamic, um, uh, well, obviously, it's a dynamic group of people, and sort of those sort of external shocks are actually really quite good at, at sort of um, telling you what your community is actually about. Um, now, I think I think the other thing about community, um, very quickly, is that the you know you have a community that sort of sits in its Discord and sort of talks to itself and maybe talks to some of the moderators. I, I think the the problem that I find for a lot of blockchain game developers. Is particularly if they come from the traditional game space, is they've they've not they've probably had communities, but they've not it's not nothing been like as sort of busy or as deep as as what we have with blockchain stuff for the reasons explained. But then those people are so busy doing the game they don't spend time in the Discord. So 
when you like talk to like the, the sort of management of these kind of companies, you know, you, you, you try and tell them, can you, you know, just spend an hour a day in the Discord just to get a flavour of what's going on there? And they go, well, I haven't got time to spend, you know, an hour a day, you know, in the Discord. I'm building this very complicated game and raising money and all this sort of stuff. But you, then you, you try to explain to them, no, that the most important thing is, you know, the point you're trying to make a, a decentralised game in which you're giving control financial control and other bits of control potentially down the line to the community and if you're not in in the discord d- dealing with all you know seeing what the actually to some degree your community members are talking about then there's no point in you making a game because you're going to make exactly the wrong game you, you know you're sort of you're bringing traditional game development heads into something you know in, into something that is totally different so so i think it, the community you know, the number of people in discord all that sort of stuff you know is it's not unuseful, but it's only useful if the game development team are in the community with them and not just hiring a bunch of moderators who have no sort of upward pressure. You need to have the sort of at least some of the management team spending time in the discord. Um, and that actually then starts to bring, you know, the community goes, well, this is the CEO. Or this is the lead game designer. Or, you, know, you know, they really feel like they're just not some, some sort of bolt on thing that's happened. Um, you know, that people actually listen to them, but that's as in many respects in blockchain games. You know, that's just such a different way of doing things um, that that I, you know, I think just people struggle struggle with that. And, and certainly, if you're a game developer who's been making games for twenty years or thirty years, like some of the people sort of I, I work with, you know, that is a really big ask for them to spend an hour in a Discord talking to, you know, maybe people who think that English is a second language, or maybe it's crazy, you know, teenagers who just want to know when their token price is going to go up. You know, that's just that's really hard work. <laughs> that really is. So you mentioned the Axie community, right? Which is obviously an yeah. enormous Discord almost. Any other good examples of blockchain gaming communities where you think maybe not not even necessarily in terms of sheer size of the community, but where you saw like this is a really active, engaged kind of community, um, community that is actually communicating with the developer also to work on the game, to actively change the game, to work on the tokenomics, these, these types of yeah. more close-knit communities that you've seen? Um, so... So expanding it out a little bit. So there's one, there's a game uh, called Illuvium, which is a sort of pretty high profile in the space. It's come from a um, the founders of the brothers of someone who's very famous in in, in DeFi, decentralized finance. Um, so they raised a ton of money, um, and, and you know, I have I have sort of views on on where sort of that game's going to go. Um, but I think what's interesting there is you know they sort of tapped into an existing sort of DeFi community with this sort of um, sort of family link. Um, and then the one thing they have done, which is quite good, and I think you know, interesting, and definitely we'll see more of, and we've not mentioned it yet, is these things called DAOs. So, <laughs> don't want to sort of kind of uh, confuse people with too many sort of acronyms, but DAOs are decentralized autonomous organizations, and and people talk about them a lot in blockchain at the moment. And basically, what they are, are, are attempt to is is a way of sort of building like a potentially a formal company structure that people who maybe hold uh, tokens or NFTs in a project actually have some sort of power um, in terms of typically sort of voting around stuff. So Illuvium is one of the few projects that has, a, you know, a, a game project that has a DAO. Um, the game's not out yet. You know, um, it has tokens that are out yet. Uh, it has tokens out. I don't think it has NFTs out properly yet. Um, so it's still kind of a, very much a work in progress. But they had, you know, they formally set up this DAO, which has been running for you know, six months or so. And I think they vote in Every so often, they vote in sort of people who are going to be sort of representatives of the of the sort of the the, the community base, and you know because the, the game's not live, so they've not really got a lot of sort of important decisions to make. But it is interesting that I think something like Discord is, is sort of like a you know you can imagine it's sort of like a town hall meeting and everyone sort of shouting at each other, and, and occasionally some the, the the mayor comes in and sort of says something, and everyone listens, and they get back to sort of shouting amongst themselves, um, which is fine, and you have a lot of energy there. But then you do need some more formal structures to actually then sort of organize people and, and actually put you know put specific things to the vote which could be something stupid like you know what's the color of the character going to be or you know or it could be something quite serious like should we spend a million dollars um employing this developer to to build some mini game or something you know um, and it could be all obviously other manner of things um down down the line and, and i think you know again that that will take many years i think to but for that sort of structure between sort of discords and, and and more formal DAO structures and there's other ways of doing it and to play out. But potentially you could see a thing where, you know, companies themselves, uh, and we all, we're already seeing this to some degree, certainly in the VC space, in the, in the, in the investment space, you know, you don't really have companies, people are setting up in blockchains, uh, people are set, setting up sort of blockchain communities, these DAOs, um, and there is no sort of legal 
governmental structure behind them. So you can't go, this this company is based in the US and, and has US law behind it. Yeah, because these are just people who have sort of organized themselves on a blockchain. They they may have like a formal sort of sort of legal framework or some sort of co- contract between them about how they're going to do stuff, but they're basically, basically just voting. Um, and you can kind of see that, and even some game you know, games have that as, as a sort of view. We'll start off with a sort of formal, normal sort of team, but then over time, maybe over a decade or so, maybe, you know, I think Axie Infinity has this as a sort of goal. More and more of the elements of what a game is get sort of passed on to the community through things like DAOs and, and, and you know, representatives from the community and people vote, you know, depending on what tokens they've got, you know, they can vote. And, and, th- and those votes are then sort of, they're not legally binding from the sense that, someone could sue them because in, because they're not, there's no law attached to it but in terms of like the structure of the project um you know those can make decisions uh about the project and about the assets that the project can you know contains so I'm not sure if i explained that terribly well but, but 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 this is sort of like you know taking taking what we have in the in the in the real world or traditional world and, and then just putting it on a basic computer system and and you know i'm sure a lot of these things will go horribly wrong we've already seen people running off with all the money um and, and they're just very hard to do well i think um but alluvium is an interesting example um of of a uh, project that, that's clearly trying to put some of these uh, features uh, quite early on into its into its sort of uh, roadmap for the future Hmm. One one question that I've been thinking about hmm. now, especially if we, if we look at so now, now we're we're still in the early days. We look at how these communities are being built. Arguably, these users are are more on the hardcore side uh, and the ones that are willing to go through all the hoops uh, to to kind of understand how how to get tokens, how to participate in sales, how to how to trade in the fees, participate in staking programs, uh, etc. Uh, and obviously in when when acquiring those users, it's very important for developers to have a very kind of personal personal relationship with them. But how do you think this will develop as as the market as the market starts maturing? We start moving up higher the stack to acquire more casual users, and if the games also become more casual, they might not be sort of as prone to be as vested in in the communities and participating as actively. So I'm thinking, do you think that the current ad tech stack? will also have a role and performance marketing as a whole at some point, or will these games sort of forever keep growing organically? Or do you think at some point when we reach a a certain type of user that the need for performance marketing will kick in again? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, this is a sort of a, we've seen the sort of start of an ongoing debate now around this where, I mean, I guess it's partly because in the free to play mobile space sort of last year was, was, um, you know, complicated by Apple, changing how you know how people could target um which um obviously has has had an impact and and we're kind of seeing people to degree moving to android even in the expectation that, that google sort of make some changes as well so i think you know in, in the non-blockchain space we've sort of seen that the be- the beautiful sort of um system that was built around uh, kind of user acquisition is, is sort of now maybe not terminally broken but but certainly certainly changed a lot um so I think to that degree, there are a lot of those ad tech companies are looking to, you know, what's coming next. And, and, and you know, we they built up over a decade, these very sort of clever algorithmic sort of systems and, and what how could they apply those to, to other things? Um, and actually, you know, there are a few people that I've spoken to who, who are sort of actively looking at sort of taking, sort of repurposing sort of uh, traditional UA tech and, and moving it to sort of blockchain. Um, I think at the moment it it is there is this difficulty that that with with sort of free to play I guess um so at the moment most blockchain games are sort of not free to play you know normally you need to buy an asset in order to sort of um experience the game and that's because if you don't do that if you're giving people sort of free things then basically loads of bots come in and basically you run out you you run out of money even if the things you give away is like a, a tenth of a cent you know, people can run up you know, billions of bots and, and basically you run out of money so so there is a sort of difficult thing that that you know and this was the genius of free-to-play mobile games was basically you were just giving everything away um and then you had this brilliant targeting system that could basically find out pretty much what anyone's tastes were and you could combine those two things very well um and maybe to sort of go slightly lateral to your question, you know, 
but equally the problem with free to play games was that there, there was basically you know a very tiny amount of people who would spend a lot of money playing free to play games and there was 99.99 whatever percent of people who never played any games maybe saw some ads um and that model sort sort of worked okay because the tar- the ad targeting system got good enough to actually work out who these sort of people who would spend a thousand dollars a month playing free to play mobile games so it sort of worked it was an equilibrium there now the different thing i think about um blockchain games is at the moment it's not free to play um i think over time you know you still have the sort of the, the whales will still be there and and sort of um have large amounts of sort of assets in the system so so the role of the whale is, is sort of almost it's, you know is always going to be there and they're going to be powerful um and in fact you know people now because blockchains are most you know the mo- most of the blockchains we're looking at now are sort of um what they call pseudo anonymous so most they're open blockchains. You can see the transactions, and so you can a lot of these whale wallets, certainly on Ethereum, are, you know, all sort of well known, and you can actually know who these people are. Which is so, to some degree, you don't sort of need clever user acquisition tracking because we can just see um, who, who these sort of people are. It becomes harder, I think, for the for the for the mass audience um, if you don't have free to play, um, and the, I think it'll be a quite a long time before the we sort of worked out the sort of balance between doing free to play stuff, which you probably can do um, in some gated way. Um, but it's still going to be more complicated than traditional free to play games. So you've got this massive audience of 3 billion people who are just used to downloading games on their phones and playing them. We, we can't download games through the app store. So, you know, there's sort of lots of those, lots of those things that are sort of built into the free to play mobile success story, you know, it's just not there. And I don't think we'll be there for a while. So, well, I'm sure kind of ad tech companies will do some clever stuff. And I think guess particularly around these sort of people with lots of assets, um, because now we can target them. You know, you don't even have to target them. That's sort, sort of um, much more obvious. Um, I think it will be hard on the sort of the on the sort of Candy Crush type game to sort of link everything together. Um, yeah. <laughs> Got it. And uh, if we start if we, if we start rounding up here here a bit what do you think now that you're also working together with uh with, with free to like free to play developers and other developers looking to get into this space have you identified any what are kind of the key challenges that these developers are facing when when trying to figure out uh mm. how to involve the communities more in the decision making i think a big part of the pitch usually around around governance tokens and and and, and other, other ways for the community to become vested in into these games is is that they will mm. have some kind of a decision making power there now obviously um the community re- rarely at least based on based on experience the community rarely knows better than the game designers how the game actually should be designed but but what could be some of the ways to to involve them yeah, I think you're right there. I mean, I think it's the it's sort of what parts what parts of the system you sort of open up um, to to input. So, you know, in general, uh, the thing that sort of worries me most about game developers building blockchain games is that, and it's not just actually developers; it's for all of us in the space. We're we're all much too sort of confident in in what in what we think we know <laughs> um so i think you know the, the one thing that we should be uh, a bit more humble about is you know a lot of this stuff can sort of change effectively overnight you know there this is a very um i mean volatile in in price in pricing and and sort of uh very changeable um in terms of the, the tech as well so the, the thing that sort of worries me the most is when sort of game developers come out and go, "This, this is the game I'm going to make, and this is sort of the roadmap for ten years." And, blah, 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 and these all these decisions sort of made, uh, and you sort of tell them, "Well, you know, that's all sort of well and good, but in six months' time, you know, you'll probably have very, very different. You know, not that you're stupid. It's just this: what you see now compared to what you're going to see in six months' time is going to be very, very different. So, so if something is very different in, in six months' time, you know, how, what, what's what's your you know how how are you going to sort of deal with that? How are you going to have the flexibility and, and the fluidity to to sort of keep some sort of core concept for what you want to do, which is obviously the sort of the creative bit of the process, but maybe change loads of other stuff around it. And I think that also plays into the community. You know, how, how can you build a community? Sort of saying you're going to make this product, and then six months down the line, go, well, we said we were going to do it on this blockchain, and we said we were going to it was going to be about this, and actually we're going to do this other blockchain, and it's going to be on mobile as opposed to PC. Or something. You know, there could be a lot of things that can change, and that's hard to bring the community along with you. So, I think at the moment, still for you know, an openness to to change stuff, um, and 
and and hopefully that sort of plays in i think for developers not to be pretending too much that they know and are in control of the system um and i think sort of paradoxically that can help with community um you know it's a hard thing because community sort of does just want to know some basic things about you know when's the game coming out you know um when's the token going to go to the moon and all that <laughs> um so it can be a bit sort of discouraging i i guess to some degree but but i think you, you sort of draw out the more thoughtful members of your community by by having that those sort of discussions where you know saying these are the things we really you know we're going to nail down and this is sort of the core of the product a lot of other stuff may, may not be uh, may have to change and that's quite difficult in blockchain because a lot of things are quite tribal so particularly which blockchain you're going to launch on is is probably the most tribal sort of thing you've got and you've got some people who who you know are, are you know religious about it and and think every, every blockchain apart from the one that they particularly own tokens on is is, is terrible and and, and and you know no one else should sort of touch it so those things are quite difficult to do um i think the other thing is um and we've spoken i guess from my viewpoint for this podcast i've spoken very much about sort of the blockchain first sort of people i think we will see a whole wave of other stuff which is much more traditional game developers sort of making traditional games but with nfts and i don't think those guys are going to be going down in 2022 are going down the route of DAOs or giving community a lot of power they're just going to be a bit like ubisoft at the moment here's a game you play the game for a bunch uh you know many hours and you can get a free nft and and i don't think that's there's nothing wrong with that you know i don't, I don't think in the long term i don't th think that's where we would hope to see blockchain gaming as being nfts as sort of this nice badge retention model that you can sort of collect but clearly i think for a lot of companies who are more traditional that's sort of where they're going to be and, and that's and i think i think that's fine and, and they'll probably you know we'll probably see a sort of a, a joining of these two extremes um uh, at some point that down, down the line and i think for most developers if you're interested in the space it's it's sort of finding your sweet spot. I think for most game developers who have been get, making games for a few years, you know, you don't want to jump in and try and make an Axie Infinity because, you know, that game took, you know, it's taken them like three years, four years to make, and it's still, you know, a long way, a long way to go to fulfill its potential. Whereas, you know, I wouldn't say the Ubisoft example so far in Ghost Recon has been a terrible, uh, you know, a great success. I wouldn't say it's been a disaster either, but it's, yeah, you know, I think it's those sort of experiments are quite good to run. And you can kind of slowly dial them up. Um, and, and as I say, I think over the years we'll sort of, you know, we'll sort of meet in the middle. And as a as, as a final question, as your uh, yeah. what is your what is your personal crystal ball, or maybe what what are your personal favorite uh, companies, projects, DAOs, yeah. games to to look out for the the, the coming year? Yeah um <laughs> it was dangerous um so yeah i'm not i don't really know, don't really know about predictions i mean the thing about blockchain is is nothing happens for a long time and, and then like everything happens overnight and that can be sort of good good and bad i think so at the moment with with sort of you know i, th I think there, there there are always sort of a lot of obstacles so you know i think we've legislation you know can always come in and and have quite a big impact i definitely think in the short term um i think um i think even stuff like sort of you know the backlash of, of gamers against NFTs and you know, actually game developers against NFTs, you know, clearly um, has has an impact as well, no, no matter how um, sort of uh, misunderstood, I, I think, the sort, sort of the sector is. So I think that there are definitely things on the negative side and just the complexity. And we're always going to see things go horribly wrong and scams. And, you know, I mean, that's just sort of part and parcel of, of running these decentralized uh, products. So in terms of you know games that i'm sort of interested in so i've mentioned alluvium i think i very i'm interested in a few games not because i necessarily think they're going to be very successful but i'm interested in the sense they're sort of they are high profile products and it's interesting to see you know how they go so alluvium is definitely one um big time is another one so big time is interesting in the sense that the ceo was, has been in crypto blockchain for a long time so he he's basically was behind this decentraland metaverse previously and he's got a really good team with him they've sort of decouple the game big time from a lot of the um speculative elements that other blockchain games sort of lean into so they have nfts and they have, they have tokens and stuff but they, they've been sort of quite careful about how they position it so i think it'll be quite interesting as a as a, a tri you know triple a type game which is sort of come from thoughtful people which is trying to do something different you know pretty well funded um so that'll be uh, one to watch as well and then in general you know, mentioned the horrible uh, metaverse uh, word i think the sandbox as well is something i followed you know for a number of years and i think that's going to be quite an interesting um sort of melting pot of many different elements um, particularly going back to community so the point of something like the sandbox is lots of different 
you know, anyone can obviously own a bit of land there if you if you pay the price. And then any and those people who own the land can then build things in there. So they could build games, they could build just little sort of um, sort of interactive areas or, or, or environments. And we're starting to see quite a lot of um, some of these NFT communities. So Bored Apes is a really big one. There's some small ones as well, sort of building their own um, yeah interactive experiences in there. So so their communities don't just live in discord they can sort of come to the sandbox and there's obviously other metaverses there as well um so so you start to see those sort of um things developing and that's also interesting because a lot of these nft projects at the moment are like 2d artwork that you know you see on twitter maybe but going into something like the sandbox obviously 3d you have 3d animated sort of avatars and, and again that's sort of bringing the whole community uh, the whole sort of a uh, blockchain uh sort of uh, sector uh the community the um uh, consumer facing sort of blockchain products sort of close uh, you know uh, bringing them more mainstream and, and i think um yeah I, I think the sandbox will be will be probably the most interesting one um assuming they come out in 2022 or, or they get they, they've been doing some like some some public testing i'm not quite sure what their roadmap is but um given they've been sort of building this since 2018 that would be a, a, an interesting one and then finally actually it's not a game but it's one called ultra which is we we're talking a bit about Steam before, so they're trying to build a, a, a basically a PC game distribution platform um, on their own blockchain. So they're definitely launched. I think their first game's coming out in in sort of May time. So again, I don't think they're going to sort of be competing with Steam <laughs> um, this year. But it'll start to you start to start to see some of these building blocks, some of these distribution sort of platforms at least launching, and, and then we'll see um, how uh, how much people are interested in them. Nice. Uh, well, that was super interesting. Uh, thank you, John. And of course, thank you to my uh, wonderful co-hosts, uh, Anton and Kenrick. For anyone who's curious about how free to play and play to earn might intersect, you should listen to the first episode on this mini series where Kenrick offers an interesting model. Um, and you should make sure to tune in for the next episode, uh, where we'll be talking to the CEO of a blockchain based game to hear about what it's like on the front lines of all the things that we've been discussing theoretically uh so far uh so yes that's all from us thank you guys for being on today thank you john thanks all thanks john thank you